I like to be busy, and uh, my office manager made a comment, it takes a pandemic to slow me down. One of the saddest moments in my stay at St. Francis um, was I had uh, someone I became friendly with for, geez, 30-something years. His name was Segundo Cali. Segundo was probably four foot 11. He spoke a couple of words of English. He was from Quito, Ecuador. And he was housekeeping. Uh, he was the guy who would clean my room. And over years, we got very, very close, very friendly. The best word I could possibly use was infectious. He was somebody who, his laugh would just make you laugh. You know, it was as if he was performing. He'd have a mop and he'd be singing and dancing. And he was a, he was a complete character with such charisma. The guy was this incredible personality. He was the ambassador to our lab. And he would stand out guard in front of the room. You'd walk into the hospital, you'd go into the cath lab, and Segunda was standing outside of my dad's room waiting to clean it in between cases, had the biggest smile on his face no matter what. And his relationship with Rich was just, you know, was something very special. Clearly they had something that, you know, was intangible. And we got very close and I helped him out in many ways. I was a godfather to his kids. Everyone in the Catholic joked he was my father's fourth son. He had more of a relationship with him technically than me. You know, I'm his son and obviously we're closer than anything, but this is someone that he spent every single day with. One of his sons, he came to me crying, you gotta help him out, and we ended up sending him back to Ecuador to um, private school. And when he came back, he joined the U.S. Marines, fought in Afghanistan, and became the highest non-commissioned officer he could be as, as a sergeant, and now works in industry with two kids. So it's a good thing was part of our life. Unfortunately, during the heat of the bad COVID, he got COVID. and didn't make it. Melissa raised somewhat over $30,000 for his family, but that yeah, was tough. Hello everyone, um, we're here now with Howard Stern. He doesn't really need an introduction and I can't thank him enough for taking the time to, to talk with us. Howard and I have spoken over the last couple of weeks about this terrible crisis that we're having. We, we were really just discussing the, the stresses, not only the people, but the hospitals and the hospital workers have been facing. And the purpose of this event is we're trying to raise money to help the hospitals and the workers get past this terrible crisis. Um, well, I, I just want to say hello, and uh, I, I don't know how you have time to raise money for anything. You are the busiest man I've ever met in my life. And I'm not wearing my uh, bandana. I was going to, but I think it was okay. <laughs> it doesn't transmit on computers, how we're good. We're all right? Oh, I thought you said it transmits on computers. No. Nah. We're all in big trouble. Hospitals around Long Island, and that's what it was called. It was Long Island is for Long Island. We needed to raise money, so we raised money. And it was done within two weeks, two weekends and a couple of weekdays. We were in a time where it was unknown. The scary part at that time, now we're past it, but the scary, we didn't know what was on the other side of the door. You know, during the COVID crisis, the nurses were there 24 seven at the bedside. I mean, they were at the patient's side, they were watching the pain they went through. They were dealing with the families who were not allowed to visit. The people I felt the worst for, in addition to the patients, were the nurses. The, the, what they went through during the COVID era, especially at this place, they are the heroes. I mean, they were the heroes top to bottom, and I'll never, I'll never forget what the nurse had to go through during, during the COVID era. It took us all by surprise, and it was a situation where we had no idea what was gonna hit us. And it hit us really bad, as we all know. But we all stuck together, and we came through it. Rich said he saw him, he can go home on platonics. Yeah. 
So this is Command Central. This is where the brain trust is, my nurse practitioner is. I certainly couldn't do what I do without them. Each one is special. We have them from six in the morning until like midnight and they round and they are me everywhere. Um, they really make everything happen and without them, nothing would happen. And everybody in the hospital knows that these are the best people. They handpick, I find the best ones, I get them, they work for us, we train them. And the criteria to be one of my NPs or PAs is to be nice. Um, and they all are incredibly nice. They're patient with my patients. Right now, what we do is after finishing the cast in the morning, they've been rounding in the morning, then we get report, we go over things, we then physically round, go over ER, new patients, and it's the office patients. So we're just gonna go down the list. 1505, he had the pneumomediastinum. He was much better today, he's gonna be going home. He had a surgery, great. him. Great. And uh, 1511, the pleural effusion, she's getting tapped. So, did you do all the work today? <laughs> I'm the only one that did anything. Uh, she she has a small to moderate effusion pulmonary. He's not sure if they want to tap her yet. I put it in ultrasound of the chest because she also has a pericardial effusion um, and a sarca, and I'm going to give her some diuretic. So she may need to be tapped. Okay. D111. So you capped yesterday, medical therapy, still working up the fever. He's running low grade. They started IV steroids, sending off like viral studies, looking at tick-borne illnesses, but nothing cardiac. Now this is Ka Caitlin. Caitlin's like, we call her pioneer woman. All my nurse practitioners get pregnant, it's ridiculous. She's working to the very last day. She's driving home on the Meadowbrooker Parkway and she delivers her own baby on the Meadowbrook. I swear, this is Pioneer Woman right here. She could have her own TV show. Pioneer Woman, and she named the kid Meadowbrook. It's lovely. But she did. Go on. Go on, Caitlin. Where were we? Nothing cardiac. Working up the fever. Working up the fever. Okay. Um, he has a history of bypass in 20, in 2002, recent AFib four months ago, placed on Xarelto, and since then has had worsening uh, rectal bleeding. He came in anemic, symptomatic, he had chest pain, shortness of breath, gave him a unit of blood, his symptoms resolved, but he's pending GI. That's Kimberly. And Xarelto's on hold, sorry. Kimberly. Kimberly, yes. when she first started with me, I was confused. I thought her name was Kimberly Ho, and I actually made up cards. <laughs> Kimberly oh, letterhead. Ho. You put on the letterhead. That had Kimberly Ho. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, she stayed with me anyway. <laughs> 2506 Six. is for Tavern tomorrow. Tavern tomorrow. And 07, walking in or no? He is walking very little. However, he had a colonoscopy today. It was a poor prep, so there was no obvious sign of bleeding. We're going to restart the Xarelto and the Plavix. Check the CBC in the morning. If it's good, he can go home. I got a call at four this morning. This is a true call. The lady calls me at four in the morning. And she said to me, for the last two days, my knuckles been bent. <laughs> my knuckles been bent. And she goes, and now my wrist is a little bent. Do you think this could be the heart? 100%. I said, no, I don't think it's the heart. She goes, well, do you think it could be COVID? I said, absolutely. <laughs> I said, did you have the vaccine? No, then it could be COVID. <laughs> the next step is I make phone calls to patients and then we start office hours at four o'clock. We have eight rooms and I go in with the NP. They see the patient beforehand, talk to them, and I go shake their hand and give them a kiss and we go over things. And then later in the day, we round in the uh, floors again. And that's how it is every day. Last day of dieting before she starts oh, her diet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. That's her, it's her last day of being able to eat cake and ice cream. Wonderful. Here you go. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Do you like to name Hunt Pleasure Hunt Paragraph? No, thank you. That takes it one step too far. Already, this is too far, but that will be way overboard. Thank you. Why do you have to put in the um, chocolate chip? That's what Ben Jerry's does. Really? Yes. That's like their. They don't have to play ice cream. That's the thing. The chocolate chip. Because that's what I'm objecting to. They have baked. Half baked. Yes. Yeah. What does that even mean? I think it's like brownies and cookies that are half baked. Brownies and cookies that are half baked. Chocolate and vanilla ice cream. Uh, here we go. AJ. What? There's cookies in here. You I know, just told you that. You know what the problem with cookies is? It's half baked. We're gonna, we're gonna move you into another room after this case. I heard. I'm excited. Which, which, room, room six. 
What are my options? No, no, not room six. It's room six. No, 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 no. You, don't put me in the corner. Wow. Do you think this is calories? No. Really? Jerry. Yeah. Yes, sir. You think there's calories in here? I'm gonna guess that there are. You think so? No, Jerry, yeah, I, see I know so. Mm. But they're empty. Oh, that's good then, right? Yeah. Empty calories are good. So this is my uh, my grandfather's diploma. Um, I'm actually the third generation uh, physician in the family. My granddad started uh, the tradition. And this is all in Latin, but it's interesting. So the graduation date is, is here, which is 1926. He, he was seeing uh, people like Sigmund Freud and lecturer and so forth, you know, a lot of the luminaries of, uh, of medicine. And then subsequently my dad uh, became an internist. And then the fourth generation I'm pretty excited is my daughter. She actually just got accepted into dental school. I did all my schooling and my medical school in, in Germany, so I have a bit of an understanding of the medical system, I guess, outside the US. I was fortunate enough to, to get a grant um, to be able to come to the US and do research. I spent two years at Stanford um, doing a lot of the research, actually, that we now take for granted, intravascular imaging, all these technologies that we at San Francis use on a regular basis to optimize dental procedures and I did um, internal medicine training at the Cleveland Clinic, and then subsequently my cardiology and interventional cardiology fellowship at uh, Beth Israel um, Hospital and Harvard Medical School in, in Boston. And what makes this place, I think, so different from, from everybody else is that it's a little bit smaller, right? So if I have a patient that I see in the office and they have to come to the hospital, I will take care of them, you know, from the beginning until end. There's no middle person here. There's no, you know, medical student or resident or fellow, and it's a very kind of a family atmosphere in, in a way. One of the things that is that is important to me, basically my research background. So while I was at, at Harvard, I also did a, a mass of science degree in, in clinical trials and in clinical study investigation and statistics. And so being involved in research, I think, is, is very, very important to me. And it's very helpful also to be and stay cutting edge. And obviously also being very involved with, with procedures and refining procedures, making them better, making them safer, getting better outcomes. All of that is, is um, critical. Yeah, I mean, the, the good news, of course, is that the absolute vast majority of patients do well. Some of them come in critically ill. You know, some of them are literally about to die. And the nice part about the field we're in, in, in cardiology, is that we really can make a difference pretty quickly. We're going to take care of everything. Today, we're going to fix the arteries. And I think next week, we're going to fix the valve, right? I think And then, uh, you know, here you go home today, the valve is an overnight procedure. And then we'll get the other thing taken care of. We were in our teens when we met. We grew up in, in the same neighborhood. The marriage has been basically wonderful. Three kids we have and five perfect grandchildren. I mean, your life, I think, really becomes centered around your grandchildren. They're a big part of what we are. We, we lost our second child, and that's about the biggest horror any parent could go through. There's nothing worse on the face of this earth than a parent losing a child. It goes against nature. They're supposed to bury us. We're not supposed to bury them. But it was tough being positive. And we had another time in our life where we had three foster children, two of whom we thought would be permanent. The, members of our family and when they were went back to their father that i think might have been even more devastating they were newborn twin boys so they were really you know we had them since birth and it, it was it was tough and the one thing i can tell you the three children that i gave birth to the love i had for the ones that i i did not give birth to there was no difference Carrying for nine months and giving birth is not what makes you a parent. It's what happens afterwards. That was, that was actually when I started nursing school. It was either do something or just drown in this, this pity and this sorrow. 
But like I said, you know, we went through it together and we got through it and I think is stronger because of it. But the world gained a, a good nurse, so something positive came out of that. How you doing? Open your eyes for me. Excellent. How you feeling? A little sleepy? Yeah. All right, any pain in that chest? Okay. You did great, it looks awesome. All right. We'll remind you again later when you wake up a little more. It's over. It's over. Amazing, right? Good job, it looks beautiful. We're going to do a Watchman insertion today. The Watchman is a small device that goes into the heart that prevents clots in patients or people who have atrial fibrillation. Uh, atrial fibrillation is a common arrhythmia that affects about three to five percent of the population, especially the older population. Its main consequence is a risk of stroke. And in people at high risk, the treatment of choice right now is blood thinners. But some people can't take blood thinners, either because they have bleeding problems, they fall, um, or because their lifestyle doesn't allow it. Anyway, to remind you, the procedure is done through a vein in the leg. What our catheter will do is it will go up through this inferior vena cava into the right atrium. We'll make a small hole to go from the right to the left. And then we're going to put the catheter right at the opening here and open up this little device. And this is actually what the device is in real life. You want to touch it you can feel how flexible it is wow. yeah so that's going to go in there and it'll plug that up so blood can't get in there so, okay procedure is going to take about an hour you're going to be asleep for it and uh, while you're asleep we'll do all this work and you wake up and it'll all be done good okay i'll see you on the other side any questions about anything absolutely no. i'm okay. good hands that okay. i know all right i see you thank you, so. you so okay. much Clots that form on the right side of the heart rarely cause strokes. The right side of the heart pumps to the lungs and the lungs act as a filter, which filters out most debris from the bloodstream. But if you get a clot in the left side of the heart, it can cause a stroke because the blood goes from the left side into the aorta and up into the brain arteries. In patients who have atrial fibrillation, the atrium is not contracting. And so the blood flows through but it gets caught up in this little blind pouch, the left atrial appendage. When the blood gets caught in there, uh, it clots. The key to this procedure is the coordination of different specialties within the room. The anesthesiologist, whose responsibility it is to monitor vital signs and to make sure the person goes to sleep and wakes up. The second team in there are the echocardiographers. They're going to uh, be providing imaging from inside the esophagus. The esophagus lies immediately next to the uh, left atrial appendage. I'm gonna pass a catheter, which is a plastic tube from the vein in the leg, the femoral vein. We're gonna come up from below and we're gonna enter through this inferior vena cava into the right atrium. We're then gonna make a hole going from the right side to the left side that's called transeptal catheterization. And then we're gonna position the catheter near the opening of the appendage, this blind pouch. And once we're in that place, we will then pull back the sheath and the watchman will pop open and we'll plug it just the way this image looks here. We'll be monitoring this with x-rays, with images done with contrast dye, and we'll also be monitoring it live with a transesophageal echo, which will actually show us the actual device in place. That's gonna help us make sure it's in the proper location and over six weeks to 12 weeks, tissue heals over it, and then that literally becomes a smooth surface on the inside of the heart and the pouch is closed off for life. Medical science has evolved. These devices have gotten better and doctors have gotten better in identifying how best to uh, place it and make it safe for the person. The risk of having a stroke on blood thinner in a year uh, for these people is often one to two percent per year. The risk of stroke during the procedure is about one in a thousand. So the procedure is 10 times safer than living with the condition. We brought the watchman to this hospital about two or three years ago. And now I've taught probably five or 10 doctors in the area how to do it as well. And we're a demonstration center for industry because we've evolved certain techniques that make it safer and more streamlined 
and uh, we think better. There's really not much trauma to their body from the procedure. They're among the happiest people we have because blood thinners are this burden on them that they're afraid of them and they're afraid of doing this or that and they're afraid of the complications of blood thinner. When people come back after three months and we tell them everything got implanted and everything settled well and now it's healed, they're among the happiest people I've met in medicine. It's a lot of mind games, there really is sometimes. You have to kind of just ground yourself, which circles back to why we sort of keep it light at times, because you need to have music and play and just sort of keep your mind someplace else, because if you really, really got into the nitty gritty, you would never be able to do this job. Just, at least I wouldn't be able to do it, and I don't know too many people who would. And anytime there's a complication or something that goes wrong, you wouldn't be able to continue your dive. It's frustrating, and I feel bad for people who don't have the medical background. There's so much out there on the internet which is good and bad at the same time because, again, you Google headache and 4,000 things come up. And you're already, if you're an anxious person, you can see where you can yeah. easily go down a rabbit hole. WebMD is the worst thing and the best thing that ever happened. Oh, I've never, I've never used can't it Google. in my entire life because you could, anything could be anything. You could have the most minor headache and you'll find a way that that turns out that it's potentially either Lyme disease or that you have a brain tumor. Yeah. <laughs> from there to there. Yeah, sometimes you know? it's, just, it's sometimes just a headache. Yeah, That's it's all it is. You're dehydrated. Color. 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 So he's out. We haven't seen him today, but we're hoping any moment, any day, crossing our fingers. Everything goes extraordinarily smoothly. We fixed one artery last week. We fixed this artery today. You didn't have any pain or anything, did you? No. Oh. All right, and then you, the tablet team, they have you scheduled, did they tell you the schedule when it's gonna be done? No. It's having a, a PET scan on Tuesday. Ah. So they may wait for that PET scan yes. before they do the they tablet. Are. Okay, so we'll touch base after you get the PET scan, call me and I'll get you the results. And we'll, you know, go over what everything says, okay? You getting done here at St. Francis? Yes. yes on Good, so I'll be, able to put, I'll be able to pull it up on the computer. Okay. So call me Wednesday morning or, and, and then I'll call you with the results, okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Today. Any Thank questions? You. Oh. We'll get you to it. You're in La La Land in the recovery room. You know, you, you see people, but you don't know why they're there. <laughs> I owe St. Francis, Dr. Schlafman, to my life. Our daughter just moved into a home and we were helping them move in. Just unpacking things, not doing anything heavy. And I got a, a headache, a bad headache, all of a sudden, just a bad headache. I sat on the couch with the ice packs behind my head and then I was getting pain in my jaw, right here. Pain like I never felt before. It was very bad and I never had it before. That just escalated. I met you uh, in a in a compromised position, if you will. So I don't know if you're aware. I was out to dinner. I just heard that. Yeah. So we were out to dinner with my family, and um, I get called that uh, somebody's having a heart attack. Could I come in right away? Which we did. So we get up there. But when you open the door, I see you on the table there, and there was a lot of activity going on. They brought me into the EKG. I don't even think she ran it for, for more than three seconds. And and I believe she just grabbed the leads, yelled out the door, ripped them off me, looked me right in the eye. She said, it's going to get very busy in here in five seconds. And she's going to be like 10 people in here. And she was right. It was. And from that point, I don't know what happened with me mentally. I think I went like somewhere your, else. You sort of left your body, let I everyone did. take over, right? No, I did. Yeah. I, I, I really did. It, I wasn't scared. Right. I, you just put yourself in there and said, take me. You went to another hospital first, right? We went to another hospital and you went, first. And, and what did they say when they They told you? me to wait in the waiting room. Right. I told them I think I was having a heart attack right. or a stroke. And they took my information, said sit in the wheelchair, and told me to go wait in the waiting room. My husband was parking the car at that point. Right. And he came in, sees me in the waiting room, and he says, what are What's you doing? Going on? Yeah. Yeah. I took her out. Yeah, you got her right. Then we're going to I think your hospital and the GPS and we just raised here. Okay. And then when you got here, they looked at you and said, mm -hmm. hey, it's going to get busy. Now they take you up to the cath lab. 
and I closed my eyes from the emergency room up to the yeah. cath lab right. and then for some reason I decided to open my eyes yeah. and I could tell because you're laying flat that there was a lot of people in there and I have to say it, it's like I had said it, it, it the cath lab the emergency room everything ran like like an orchestra <laughs> everybody had a job and everybody did their job from what I can remember and everybody's doing their job and then all of a sudden you're standing right next to me and it's nighttime that they beamed me down there they beamed you down yeah and um i remember saying to you i'm going to be a grandmother yeah i remember January. you said that yeah and i don't remember if i told you this but um 39 years ago to the day my father had a massive heart attack and died well, same day that's chilling yeah. yeah well you're not going to so let me tell you a little about what happened so what yes. so what happens is you're on that table and i see you and like you said it's like an orchestra and i always say our cath lab is like a, like really like a ballet everything happens and you put it exactly how i put it everybody knows their job there's no verbal communication necessary almost everybody knows what i'm doing what they're doing we work as a team and i may be doing one thing they're doing another and if they're doing that we switch and do whatever we have to do and they're the most incredibly trained professionals when I get there, I see you. I saw your EKG had ST elevations. You were having a heart attack. We opened it up, put a stent in, and as soon as we opened up, your EKG went back to normal. I looked at the other two arteries. They were 100% normal. And I looked at the heart function, and that was normal. So now I have this person with normal heart function, and now three normal arteries. You weren't born looking that good. <laughs> so that means your prognosis is not good. It's great. It means you guys are going to be stuck together a long, long time. That's fine. Um, right now, you're not feeling any palpitation, dizziness, or anything. No. So, no. You, so right now, you're taking the Xeralto, the Effian, and what else are you taking? Diltiazem and Topol. Okay. So you will be on something for cholesterol, and that's a preventative thing. Okay. Now you're not going to necessarily, uh, you're not going to be on the Effian long term. I'll probably keep you on that six months. Okay. Just switch it to a baby aspirin. Okay. You're on two blood thinners, so you may have some bruising and black. Yes. Yeah. I do. Well, fortunately, bikini season's over. So. That's yeah. Now, in terms of activities, your, your leg healed up okay? There's a little swelling there, but nothing bad? Yeah, no, nothing bad. Okay. So, in terms of activities, you have zero restrictions. Okay. Zero. You can put her to work, she can wash dishes, she can take the garbage out, she can vacuum. You can take a good walk. Don't give her any kind of sympathy. <laughs> She's probably the healthiest person in this room right now. That's what daily foot massages is on foot, that list. Yeah. <laughs> but she's really in great shape, so you don't have to baby yourself. Exercise as much as you want. You don't necessarily have to go to rehab because you're not sick, but if you do it on your own, walking is the best exercise. You don't have to jog, you don't have to go to, you know, spin cycle or whatever they call those things. Okay. Well, my wife has a treadmill, she works out. I walk over to get to the refrigerator, but uh, that's about all the activity I do. But, uh, but walking is the best thing for you, right? And you have my number, as you know, you can reach me 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? right. If you need anything. Which is really amazing because I'm coming here thinking of you, and I didn't even think. Does he know you came here thinking of me? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get beat up, right? And I, I always tell my wife, nobody should die of a heart attack. You get here soon enough, we're going to fix it. All right? Thank Any you. questions? All right. Thank you. All right. I almost forgot. I slaved all day making these for you. Now, we actually. They're supposed to be for you in the cath lab. And, okay. <laughs> but you can share. Yeah, they're still up there. Thank you. I took it one step oh. further. This is for you, so you have a little goodie bag to bring home. Oh my God. You really <laughs> and here's a card. And I know they're not heart healthy, but. Well, have you seen my waist recently? Do you actually think my wife's going to let me eat a cookie? <laughs> so you eat it. Thank you. All right. I'm sure they're going to love it. Thank they, you. You will. All right. Trust me. You know what they're called? Cookies? They're called, I want to marry cookies. Really? <laughs> I bet you can't give me that. I'll be careful giving you that. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I mean, I mean, I asked him, like, what, what do I do now? And he says, go home and live your life. Like, I, I don't even have, I don't even have words. I don't even know what to say. It's. Everybody at St. Francis is wonderful. They all had a part to play and they they played it like an orchestra. 
but they, they played it well. And that's because I'm here to tell you my story. I mean, he is very, very symptomatic. He came to me, um, you know, as a second opinion. He's grown up so long. You didn't have the capability because it was something that was beyond your control. For our patients today who's undergoing a PET CT scan, it's like a nightmare that you live afterwards. Giving patients and their families uh, upsetting news is difficult. I did not picture that I was going to deliver my own baby by myself. Brand new Cause I don't get old loving you